how much did you sell the car for and how much is it worth today? And how do you feel about that? <laughs> this is literally, this is literally true. The car got crunched at Sebring in 1966. My dear friend and co-driver, Jack Slote, drove it up on the sandbank and mashed it up a little bit, but enough so we couldn't keep going. Um, so we put it on the trailer, took it back to the garage in West Palm Beach. They banged it out and patched the paint and everything else was, didn't need any work because the car had just a few hours on it. And they said, that'll be $3,600, please. And I said, okay, hold it. I'll go get the 3,600. In the meantime, some other things happened. I'll cut that out. I found a guy in New York who would would buy it from me for $3,600 and then I could pay the garage for the damage because my friend Jack didn't have any money. Mm. He And he paid me later, but that's another story. Meanwhile, a kid from New Jersey who was working at the garage in West Palm agreed to drive it up Route 1 from Florida to New York over the road with a dealer plate on it. And that happened. And chapter 11 in that book is Spike's story about doing that. Um, so I got paid the 3600 bucks, and uh, I paid German Motors. $3,600 in 1966 would be about 20K today. So it wasn't peanuts. And everyone laughs and says, $3,600? You could buy a couple of meals with that. But that's not true. I had bought it for 10K, uh, which is about 85 thousand now? I don't know. I have to look at the uh, inflation tables. But anyway, $3,600, not a lot of money. Car went away. I lost sight of it. And the next time I saw a GTO was in an ad. No, it was a report on an auction. The feds had confiscated one of these cars from a drug dealer. And they had turned it over at auction First, about around 85000 in then-year dollars. What year was this? That would have been around, uh, somewhere around 1970. Somewhere yeah. in there, a dentist in uh, Minneapolis got hold of the car. He kept it for 20 years. And he cut on it, he chopped on it, he changed stuff. Uh, he ran it in vintage races. He drove it on the road and uh, then sold it to a guy in Japan for, I believe, $4 million. The Japanese collector kept it for 10 years. So it came back to the U.S. in 2004 for, I believe, $10 million. But that was about the time when these cars began to really escalate in collector value, collector's willingness to pay these high prices. Uh, the next installment is another one of the GTOs was sold at auction for $48 million. And then, I believe about four years ago, Dave McNeil, who owns the WeatherTech company, you may know WeatherTech, it's a yeah. car accessory outfit. He bought um, one of the later cars for $80 million. My car, the this car, is the first one and the last one running in international competition. I won the trophy first in class at Daytona in the 24-hour race, the first 24-hour race there, in 1966. So the car has an interesting history, and I think it's worth $100 million. 
a couple dollars more than 3600 Now, how do I feel about it? Well, the day that car left on the trailer to go to the garage and get the last touch-up before Spike hit the road with it, my wife and I stood in the driveway with martinis, and we drank a toast and said, Bye-bye, Sophia. It was nice knowing you, honey. Mm. And... That's how we felt then. We got a divorce, and later on, when the newspaper article came out about the 85K, I clipped it and sent it to her. And then after that, just, you know, it sort of didn't matter. The numbers kept going up, and I thought, this is, this is just crazy. These are all wore out race cars. Yeah. You, you, you have no idea how uncomfortable it is to drive one for more than 15 minutes on the <laughs> road. You know, it's not a grocery getter. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but it has this mystique. And that's what drives the price up. Well, 3223, this, this car is perfectly restored down to the rivets, uh, to the condition on February 14th, 1966, when we started in the 24 hours of Daytona. It is a perfect restoration. It's got all correct parts. Everything in it might just as well have come out of the factory. It's pristine. Gotta be worth a lot of money. I probably won't get any of that. <laughs> Well, I've had a good relationship with the owners, and so that's okay. We're friends, and uh, we kind of scratched each other's back there for, you know, a few months, and it's okay. He's a very enthusiastic supporter of the book, and uh, is tickled that it tells the story the way it does. Hmm. Uh, no, no punches pulled, and uh, he drives it. He takes it to a private racetrack and rings it out every once in a while. So it's running. It's not a garage queen. And uh, the parts that I've written in there are about actually driving that thing. He can corroborate. That's what it is. And uh, that's the story. So the big bucks eluded me, but I would have never kept it, you see. I wouldn't have... Joy wouldn't have let me keep it. Yeah. She said... It's time to dump this thing. It's had too much effect on our lives and our bank account. And besides, it was very hard to run two race cars and have a day job. Think about it. Yeah. So there was something to be said for getting rid of that thing at a penny a pound if necessary. <laughs> and everybody said, oh, well, that's okay. It's just a worn out old car. It's four years old. A four-year-old race car is just a, a lump. It's just bleeding oil on the garage floor.